So welcome everyone to this webinar on UK universities from a triangle of sadness to a brighter future. I'm Bobby Duffy. I'm director of the Policy Institute at King's College London. It's a real pleasure for me to be chairing today's discussion with some of the key leaders in understanding the challenges higher education is facing and possible routes through it. So I'm not going to attempt to preempt uh, what these are, uh, as we'll hear from Shitij and the panel, who I'll introduce properly shortly. Uh, and we only have one tight hour uh, for this uh, session. But I did just first want to very quickly say about the overall programme we're running on the issue from the King's Policy Institute throughout the course of this calendar year. Um, and our aim here is to inform thinking on the future for the higher education system as a whole, uh, with new analysis and insights. It's not to lobby for a particular outcome or section of the sector. Uh, and it has three main elements. Um, first, there's, there's this strand around convening. Um, and this is just the first in a series of events that we'll be running, including in partnership with many others in the sector, I hope, uh, given the great work being done by sector organizations like UK and HEPI, uh, and very many individual institutions like UAL and individual leaders beyond that. Uh, and I'll say a word about our next event at the end uh, of the session today. Um, second, we'll be running a new survey of the public, parents and young people, looking particularly at long-term trends to understand what's really changing. Because I think there's lots of misperceptions out there about what's shifting and what isn't. Um, so we'll try to understand what's really happening and what's driving those real changes and what that means for the future. And then the third and final strand is Professor Alison Wolfe, who's based here at King's College London, uh, will be convening a series of roundtables and learning seminars uh, focused on lessons and ideas from other countries, uh, starting with the home nation of Ireland, but then building out to other regions of the world over the next few months. And I say all this up front because uh, of that point about partnership and connection on this being vital. Um, there's so much great work going on around these issues. And we're very keen to work together with others, make sure we're not duplicating what others are doing, but instead hopefully getting to a stronger understanding by working together. Uh, so please do get in touch if you want to connect on any of those strands. Uh, but to get started on this program, we're here to discuss the recent paper, I've got a copy here, uh, by Professor Shitij Kapoor, who's Vice Chancellor and President of King's College London. Uh, and the link to the report, I think, will appear uh, has appeared magically in the chat for you now. Um, so we'll start this session with Shitty taking us through the main themes of his paper for 10 minutes or so. Uh, and after that, our excellent panel will offer remarks of six or seven minutes each. And we'll hear first from Vivian Stern, MBE, Chief Executive of Universities UK, then from James Purnell, who's President and Vice Chancellor of the University of the Arts London. And then finally, Lord David Willits, who is former Minister for Universities and Science, now President of the Resolution Foundation, and a very valued visiting professor here at the Policy Institute. Uh, then we'll have 20 minutes or so uh, for questions from the audience. And we had over 700 signups um, today for the event. Uh, so do get in early. You'll get more chance of getting uh, your question asked if you get in early. Use the Q&A function and do upvote the questions that you like. And then we'll wrap up by 2 p.m. on the dot, I promise. Um, so first of all, uh, over to Shitish. Uh, thank you very much, Bobby, and thank you to the King's Policy Institute for setting up this series. And at this lunchtime hour, my thank you to the other panelists and for the audience for joining us. Even though I can't see you, I'm assured there's hundreds of you out there, so welcome. Um, there are three points I might want to make to start us off. <clears throat> The first is that we have one of the finest university systems in the world, and it's a university system worth fighting for. The second is that I would say that the system is in a bit of a funk. It's not a very technical term, but what I would like to say is this is not a system in decline. It's a thriving system, but it's a system that's at a state of precariousness. And unless we do something about it, we will lose what is great about the system. But finally, I think our task is not to overdiagnose it or to come up with interesting embellishments and terms to describe the problem, but hopefully to converge on some prospective solution. And I think this year is a particularly important one. All of us know we're in the midst of an election cycle, but it's also true as a PwC report has recently said that close to 40% of our universities are working close to a deficit situation. And we wouldn't want a university to fail because we will, of course, react to that, but that will be a knee jerk reaction. So in many ways, I'm hoping that this is the kind of discussion, as are the other discussions happening, that will lead us to a prospective solution. So let me start with why I think we do have one of the finest systems in the world. 
I think the first lens that you have to see a university system through is through that of the students. And it would be fair to say that the British university system now, since it's widened its participation, now offers one of the highest levels of access to all of our high school leaders. But more importantly, it's not just access, it's success. So if you look at the graduation rates of British universities, the average in the OECD is about 64%. We are at about 80%. So this is a university system with a high level of quality that takes students all the way through graduation. The second measure of success is, well, that's fine for our students here. What does the world think of it? International students see this as a system of choice. So whenever you do surveys across the world and you ask, well, who has the best quality system? The British system is always the first or the second. Now, students make their choices based on a number of considerations, but quality is one of them, and the British system is always ranked amongst the highest. And then, of course, is the way they vote. So um, and the number of international students that are coming here have exceeded the government's expectations to where now, by some measures, international student education is our third largest export. And finally, is the research outcomes of these universities for the pound invested if you look at the research outcomes in terms of international peer review and citations and a technical index called the Field Weighted Citation Index, you see that our universities produce some of the very best outcomes in research. So it is a very, very good system, dare I say the finest in the world, but I think the system now sits in a triangle of sadness. And I use the word the triangle to point out the three stakeholders who seem to be a bit unhappy with the system, but unhappy for different reasons. And the first stakeholder, of course, is the student who does get good outcomes, but is not necessarily happy with the loan that they have to bear to, to go through the English system. And I have to differentiate here, uh, the Scottish students are not in the same uh, basket as the English student. So the average English undergraduate today leaves with a loan of about 55,000 pounds, and that is the highest loan anywhere in the world. Now, most of us instinctively think, well, the American universities, you know, they are the costlier ones, the loans there must be higher. And of course, if you're talking about Harvard and Yale, that's probably true, but there are 18 million uh, American undergraduates or all different sorts and do, do not on average leave with a 55,000 pound loan. But, but it's not just the loan. I think what goes hand in hand with that is an imbalance. The English government today, which is essentially the English public today, makes the lowest contribution to university education. So across the OECD, the average public contribution to university education is somewhere in the range of about 50%, whereas the English contribution to higher education is about 10 to 15%. So in some ways we have the most privatized but widely public system of university education. So that's one level of satisfaction from the students who, dissatisfaction from the students who receive it. And of course, it's getting worse as the cost of living bites even further. The second is the university staff. And the reasons for this are complex. But if you actually look at the last five years, the English higher education system has been riven with industrial dispute. Now, many would say, well, that's just trade unions and that's what they do. But I would urge you to look a little bit closer. And if you look at measures of staff satisfaction surveys, and these are cross-sector comparisons where you can look at the engagement of employees with their place of employment, you find that universities have been falling down. And in fact, are now somewhere in the lowest quartile. And then if we look within universities, you find that the level of staff engagement amongst the academic staff is far lower than that of professional staff. And then when you start to look for reasons and ask people about it, it turns out to be around workload and precariousness of employment. And it would be true that over the last decade that has increased. So the students are not too happy, the universities are not too happy. And finally, when it comes to broader society, it would be fair to say that despite a considerable widening of access, the sort of shine is coming off. And it's for different reasons. For some, the economic advantage of going to university is declining. Now I should make it very clear. It is still an economically good deal to go to university. There is a pretty good graduate premium, but it isn't as high as it used to be. And as compared to some other countries, it isn't keeping up. Secondly, of course, I think for many people, 
in the public who are casual observers of universities. Universities have sort of become the focal point of the so-called culture wars. But the last point is that the universities have maintained um, their system over the last decade through a hefty increase in international students. And while by many measures that's a success, it is a mark of reputation, sadly, it has gotten caught into the immigration debates to where it's being seen as a problem. So I think we're caught, as I call it, a triangle of sadness. You can give it different names. Mm -hmm. But if I were to find, look for one fundamental reason that is underlying all of this, is that the financial and the business model on which the universities were set off post Brown review in 2012 uh, doesn't work anymore. So I think the first fix is that we have to find a way to resource our universities in a way that keeps up with inflation. So very simply to look at the numbers, a fees was set in 9,000. If it would have kept up with inflation, it would be close to about 13 to 14,000 today, but it is 9,250 and you can do the rest of the mathematics. So we are in a very unstable equilibrium, largely being maintained with the support of international student fees. And if we do not do anything, one or two, these outcomes will happen. Either universities will continue to increase their reliance of international students, and that is now becoming, I would say, politically difficult and toxic in our own domestic environment, or they will sacrifice their quality of, and outcomes. And I think that would be really sad, given that we have one of the finest systems in the world at the moment. So the question is, where should this come from? Frankly, there are two choices. Either you can increase the fees or you can increase the grants. And my preference and, and claim at the moment would be that given the balance of where our system sits, given that the English undergraduate already has one of the highest loans, and given that the English public through the English government subsidizes uh, education to the lowest levels in the OECD, we do need to look to a higher grant rather than a higher fees. But once it is then set and corrected to inflation, I think it is for the universities to manage their cost. And I, I feel pretty confident that we would be able to raise our productivity to manage within that envelope. The second is, of course, the cost of research. Uh, UK universities are undoubtedly powerhouse of research, and I've given you the evidence for it. Uh, and in fact, the anecdotal one one can look forward is to the Oxford uh, AstraZeneca vaccine that many of us who are listening might have benefited from. But what many of us don't know that uh, a year ago, our universities did about 16 billion worth of research of which only 11 billion was externally funded. So where did that extra 5 billion come from? It largely comes from tuition fees. So there is a tremendous cross-subsidy. And I've just shared with you just a moment ago that our domestic tuition fees does not meet our costs. Uh, so where is research support coming from? It's coming largely from international student fees. So I find it highly precarious that something that is as vital to the nation's strategic competitiveness is largely being funded by the hands of decisions by individual families in Shanghai and Delhi through choosing to send their sons and daughters to be students at UK universities. So I think this is a very precarious dependence of what I think is a very precious national asset, and we need to rethink this balance. Now, how might that be done? Well, in some sense, uh, the, the mechanism is relatively straightforward. Uh, when universities submit their research proposals, they calculate something called a full economic cost of research. And when the government chooses to fund it, it says, great, we will fund this research. We know what the full economic cost is, and we will give you 80% of it. So that is the agreement at the moment, that we only fund 80% of what we actually recognize to be the full cost of research. And I think that has to change. Now, government is not the only funder of the research, but the reality is the way that government funds research sets a tone for the system within universities, it sets the tone for our interactions with philanthropic organizations. So I think this is one step that is well within the reach of government to correct. They could convert, correct it with a stroke, but the question is, it will cost more. And if that money cannot be found, I think the government and the universities do need to engage in a debate 
that do we want to do 100% of the research we do currently at 80% of the cost with unreliable cost subsidies from elsewhere, or do we need to the pivot the system to slightly more full cost recovery, even if it comes at the cost of the total amount of research that is funded by government? The last point that I would make uh, is that while I think that the first two things are matters of urgency, and if not res resolved in the next year or two, I think the system would be in trouble. The third is we need to think whether we have the system structure right. At the moment, we have about 154 universities. The, the tariff for them is all the same. Uh, when the fee system was first set, there was, of course, hope that the market would lead to fee differentiation. That has not happened. The market has not worked. So the question is, do we need to differentiate the system in some way? And by that, what do I mean? If you look around the world, you find two types of differentiation. You find systems in Singapore and China and Korea and even California, where through some central decision mechanisms, uh, universities are given different missions and funding according to their mission. Or the systems that are currently being tried in Australia and Canada, where there are fee differentials that are being contemplated. Now, these, these are early experiments. We don't as yet know the results, and I don't know what would be the right for UK, but I think we have to be open to the idea of differentiation. So let me end by saying, we have a world leading system. We need to defend it. The system is caught in a triangle of sadness. We need to break out of it. We need to link peace, or more importantly, the unit of resource the students get to teach an undergraduate to RPI or some such index. We need to make sure that government research is funded fully, and that will have ripple effects everywhere. And then we need to be open minded about differentiation as we go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shitij. Um, great overview of the paper. Um, more detail can be found in that link in the chat for people who want to follow up. And uh, I'm just going to hand over to Vivian, but just before, um, great questions coming in as well from the audience there. Do keep adding those as we go through and do upvote um, where you can. It's great. Uh, Vivian. Great. Thank you very much. And first of all, if, if you haven't read uh, Shitij's paper, I highly recommend it. It is a very thought-provoking piece of work. It should be clear, we were just discussing before we went live, uh, the fact that the reference comes from the title of a film, uh, which if you haven't seen, I highly recommend, although it's not a kind of Friday night pizza on the sofa movie, at least if you are going to eat pizza, do it in the first third of the film. Um, but I'm going to take as my text a different film, um, the 80s classic Gremlins, um, because I think when you look at the situation that we face in the higher education sector, actually not just in the UK, but many of the competitor systems or comparator systems around the world, um, there's something to be there's something to be said for the argument that the analogy we should be considering is, you know, that scene in Gremlins with the swimming pool. So you you will know because all of you will have seen Gremlins. Um, that if you get a gremlin wet, it produces lots of other gremlins. If you pop a gremlin in a swimming pool, you know, all hell breaks loose. You know, lots and lots of gremlins who produce other gremlins. And I guess my argument is, we can deal with the gremlins, or we can ask ourselves the question, what is the swimming pool? And I'm going to argue that the swimming pool is massification, that each of our systems are dealing with the logical consequence of a drive to go from an elite system of higher education to a mass system of higher education. And that what we are working through, not only in the UK, but in every other major uh, uh, advanced economy that I'm really familiar with, is the consequences of working out fundamentally how you pay for that and the anxiety that is produced by taking something that used to be elite and therefore have a certain sort of status and understanding of um, consistency which is now a, a very large system, which is much more diverse, and in which, you know, not everybody is in an elite. It's impossible to be so. I would argue um, that massification of the higher education system is a good thing. It's been a good thing for us. It's been a good thing for every other system um, that has been engaged in doing it. And, you know, if you look across the OECD, and um, all but one of the countries in the OECD group have expanded participation in the last 10 years. And although the UK is kind of out there towards the front, 
um, with a 55% uh, participation rate. It's not, it's not in the top six. You know, the countries that are ahead of us are Canada, Japan, Ireland, South Korea, Australia, and Luxembourg. It's, I would argue, pretty clear from uh, a range of sources that there is a strong correlation between um, the participation rate in higher education and the performance of the economy, although we're all asking ourselves the question, why has productivity not expanded in the way we might have imagined it would with the expansion of participation in higher education? And I highly recommend an article in The Economist um, this week on that subject. But nonetheless, there is a correlation between the participation rate and GDP uh, per capita. And when you look at both the, um, the individual rate of return uh, for uh, tertiary education across the OECD, as in the UK, there is a strong individual benefit and there is a strong benefit to the state. You know, when I'm engaged in, in arguments with, um, with uh, politicians about funding higher education, I, I like to point out you do make a profit on your investment in higher education. I mean, it is, it is, you do literally make a profit. Now, it would be handy if the IFS updated their figures on this because the change in the loan terms means that the, the uh, calculation will have changed. But the IFS um, calculated a few years ago that when you thought about the higher tax take um, and national insurance contributions, and you factor in things like the uh, fact that a very small proportion of graduates are likely to be on non-work uh, benefits. Um, the public purse makes a profit um, of about 110,000 for men and about 30,000 for women. So like, this is a really good way to spend your, your money. I guess though, it doesn't help us with the problem that we face immediately, which is that um, it costs a lot to expand participation. And I think, that perhaps explains why you get uh, quite a large number of people in in, in uh, public life and politics arguing that perhaps this massification business, business has all gone too far. They may understand that if we carry on down this road, uh, you know, the costs become very hard to see how you will sustain. And I would say, you know, there's a there's an argument we have to carry on down this road because you're still twice as likely to enter higher education if you're from the higher social uh, groups in society as the you know compared to the least advantage so i'd say we've got massification we ain't done with it you know the swimming pool um you know it might feel like it's full it probably isn't quite yet so that gives politicians a hard question to answer about how you fund massification and it's a question we as a higher education sector can't afford to dodge um either i mean some of you in this room will know that i think this is both the most um fascinating and difficult political problem i think uh, i i've ever kind of encountered i think i describe it sometimes as a kind of puzzle box you kind of turn it around and around and you try to find a way in but like all puzzle boxes it starts with a single piece it starts with a single move and for me as a um, relatively simple organism the, the simple first step we must take is to stop the amount of money that is put into the funding of teaching for an individual student going down in all four nations of the UK. In England, for me, the simple solution is you have to, you have to link the fee uh, to inflation, as Shittish has argued. That's not putting the fee up, that's simply stopping it going down. It isn't going to be a complete solution, but I think that at least puts the brake on a decline which is accelerating and which is beginning to lead to real trouble in a number of very significant, uh, in a significant number of cases. Beyond that, and um, we should pay much more attention to the point that um, Shittage made about the underfunding of uh, research. About 5.6 billion, as Shittage has said, um, of universities' own investment is going into um, funding the UK's research efforts. It's essential for the UK to remain competitive that we preserve our position as a as a leading research system. But that funding is coming from somewhere and largely speaking, it's coming from the international student fee. And that is now being placed under pressure as universities increase increasingly need to subsidize domestic um, education with the proceeds of that activity. So the second thing I would say is we, and I mean UK, should be talking much more about that side of the house. It is, it is something I think there's a consensus the UK needs to continue to double down on to maintain its competitiveness in. And if we don't pay attention to it, you can fix the undergraduate teaching problem, but you're, you're not fundamentally gonna uh, change the, the, the calculation in many institutions. The final thing, of course, relates to international students. 
And my message to government for the last uh, couple of months have been, look, if you cannot help us, at least stop it getting worse. Like, don't actively do something that will make it harder for universities to subsidize domestic teaching and, and research. And that's why I think it's so incredibly important that we don't do more to make the UK an unattractive destination um, for international students. That doesn't solve the puzzle in the puzzle box, but I think those, those are the three things that we must focus on in the short to the medium term, whilst we put our thinking caps on and work out how you genuinely fund a mass system of higher education, in which I would argue participation is likely to increase, not decrease over time, and um, which I think, as Shittish has uh, indicated, will involve innovation in our sector too. I'm going to stop there. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you so much, Vivian. Um, let me hand over to James. I'm really interested in what film reference James is going to bring into his his talk. James. I have an unpublished book reference, if that will entice people into uh, into listening all the way through. So thank you very much for, for having me. Thank you to Bobby for and colleagues for putting the event on and to Shittage for his fantastic uh, article uh, stimulating this discussion. Uh, at the end of conferences, I'm often reminded of uh, Maurice Udall, who was an American politician, who once said that they had reached the point where everything had been said, but not everyone had said it. And I've been editing out vast tracts of my uh, sections of my speech based on what Shittish and Vivian have said, but at least I'm not David Willis, who has to follow on from the three of us. Um, so I wanted to start from a glass half full, in fact, probably three quarters full uh, perspective, uh, citing you know, everything that is really great about our system, but Shittij has done that uh, extremely eloquently. Um, and then, as he reminds us, that's not how it feels on the ground. Uh, I think his description of a triangle of sadness has uh, has caught a mood very accurately. So so why are we here? Um, you know, the success, I think, is because uh, of bold and wise decisions taken by uh, people in the past, both governments uh, of the last uh, 25 years, people around the sector, you know, actually the aspiration of students and, and, and parents. But if that is the case, why is it that we feel very differently day to day in, in, you know, in, in many of our institutions? And I think actually Shittage uh, put his finger on it when he said that we have neither a real market nor a strategically managed system. Uh, and that challenge of being stuck between a real market uh, or having a strategically managed system uh, it isn't unique to HE. I think we feel it sharply in HE, but I don't think it's unique to us. In fact, at one point, I was writing a book about it. Um, uh, it was a, a book about planning. Uh, Ed Miliband once asked me what the book was about, so I described it to him with enthusiasm, and he paused and said, oh, dear, James, even I think that sounds boring. So the book the book never made it to uh, 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 made it to the public. But I do think that is a central challenge of, of many policy questions, which is how you can reconcile individual choice with having uh, uh, an overall plan, and that includes a plan to fund that overall ambition. So I would say that was one of the things that was extremely important and useful about the 50% target uh, that the 1997 Labour government uh, set, which I was involved with setting. Um, because it created that overall framework. It meant, for example, that when we were going into discussions with the Treasury about what support was needed for education, for higher education, the 50% target was the starting point. So it wasn't a question of whether we should go in that direction, but how it should be uh, made possible. Uh, then in 2014, uh, the, the coalition, in fact, uh, uh, added on top of that policy uh, removing the cap on uh, student numbers, which really let the individual choice side of the equation that I've set out fly. So you had, you know, actually the target hadn't been abandoned by then, but you know, there was the sort of ghost of the 50% target and you had individual choice being allowed to, to, to flourish unfettered. So the 2014 changes, the international education strategy have led to a big expansion of the sector, both domestically and internationally. Um, I think it's fair to say that this government doesn't feel comfortable, I would say, in its bones with that expansion. Uh, you know, from, from what it says, it feels like there's a feeling that too many people are going to university. But 
On the other hand, the government doesn't want to come out and set a, a, a lower target for all sorts of understandable reasons. So, so I would say that's in the end why we're stuck in the triangle, because we still have a system that supports, as Vivian says, participation of 55 percent, but without the money or the underpinning consensus and foundations to, del to deliver that. Now, I think we actually can have individual choice in having a plan, and this is the core of what I want to say in response to Shutich's uh, provocation. And I think the sector must lead on this in trying to create that framework uh, uh, for, uh, for the government and with the government. So Policy Exchange, for example, has put one uh, uh, proposal out there, which is uh, capping the numbers at 30%. And that clearly would be an exit route from the triangle of sadness. It would mean that more money could go into skills training. Um, it would mean that government grants for universities would go further uh, than they go at the moment, certainly if they weren't uh, uh, cut proportionate to the cut to 30%. Now, I don't think that would be the right way to go, but at least it's an internally consistent system. Uh, I don't think it's the right way to go for the reasons that Vivian set out in terms of participation, what other countries like us are doing, supporting the knowledge economy that we uh, that we are. I, I also think it would be a cap on aspiration. Uh, you, you know, David often quotes this, Nick Hillman quotes this, but the remarkable Millennium Cohort study finding that 97% of mothers want their young children to go to university is something that we have to bear, uh, take into account in creating policy. So what do we, what would be an alternative? Um, well, I think, I, I won't say what, today what I think the participation level would be, but I do think we need an overall framework to guide and support individual choice. And I would say that would need to have uh, four key planks. First of all, we need to agree what proportion of students are going to university, into other training, into apprenticeships, uh, and at what cost. Secondly, we as a sector need to commit to being as efficient as possible, helping ourselves. That uh, amount of self-help would decrease the need for public funding, but it wouldn't eliminate it. Uh, second, we need a consensus on the number of international students, because that's clearly an important element of the, uh, of the system. Third, as Shatija said, we should review research grants uh, funding and whether that uh, deficit is still acceptable, whether it can be eroded. And then finally, having done all those things, we would work out how to make the system affordable, increasing the tuition fee and, I would say, uh, uh, grants in an ideal world, um, or increasing the number of international students. Or if we don't do either, we have to accept either a lower level of quality or a smaller level of participation. Having that framework would mean that the system was internally consistent, and I think it would allow us to escape the triangle of sadness that we're debating today. Thank you so much, James. That was great. Um, so finally, from David, and just your last chance to uh, put a question in or upvote someone else's question. David. Well, thank you very much, Bobby, and three uh, fascinating presentations to follow uh, on after. I guess my film, I have to say, would be Groundhog Day. And um, these sort of rather agonized discussions about our education have been going on for a very long time. And all three political parties at the end of these deliberations and enormous amounts of political argument always end up with something basically like the system we've had for the past 20 years, though with changes in the calibration. And uh, I have to say, I think she did wrongly. It's, it's a great pity that he begins his paper by comparing it with the US because it is not debt in the sense of US commercial debt. And when he uses terms like graduates defaulting, graduates don't default in the graduate repayment system. So he starts with a much more American model than it is. And I hear I rather agree with James. And we have ended up in a sometimes uncomfortable, sometimes rather effective mid-Atlantic position. The debt is a not a credit card debt. It doesn't affect your ability to take out a mortgage despite the anxieties of parents. It's quite progressive. Um, on the other hand, it's not a continental European system with high levels of uh, higher proportionate levels of public expenditure per student. Though often, of course, actually, we don't talk about this. Sometimes also some real fees, actual real checks that students pay when they arrive at universities, which you do get. They're modest, but you do get on several continental countries, which in England, quite rightly, would be thought completely unacceptable and regressive. And we've got here because the uh, nirvana that Shittig envisages where higher education is a priority for increased public expenditure sadly always eludes us. And it indeed 
I would say, as an observation of education secretaries across different political parties, higher education isn't even a priority within the education department, let alone across government. And I, I predict uh, if Bridget Philipson were to become education secretary, I can tell you what her first speech will be. It'll be about the importance of early years, how they're going to invest in early years, how they're going to increase access to um, uh, childcare and how they're going to enrich the primary school experience. That is the re reality of the environment. So what happens, if I may say so, she's got it the wrong way around. What happens to almost every university minister is you start hoping that you might get some more public money, then you find you can't, so what do you do? And what you observe, just as a fact, let's not be, is by and large graduates earn more than non-graduates. We can have an elaborate argument about why that is, uh, but that doesn't matter in this context. Graduates earn more than non-graduates. So if it is reasonable to expect graduates when they're above a certain income level to start paying back, 9% above a threshold. Um, and by and large, that system is relatively progressive. The people who try to make it look regressive carefully ignore the non-graduates. They mainly make their comparisons within the graduate community. It's relatively progressive. And fortunately, as students don't pay up front, it doesn't, contrary to, again, what Shittage implies in his paper, it doesn't put off young people from applying to university. It, it's, it, when my 9K fees came in, it continued to grow. So it doesn't put students off because they understand the system. Sometimes they understand the system rather better than their parents do. They're not paying up front. They'll pay back at 9% above a high threshold. And if you're earning 40,000 a year and the threshold repayment threshold is 25,000, you're paying 9% on 15,000 uh, uh, 15, pounds. You're paying just over 100 pounds a month. And I always say to all my parliamentarians who say, all oh, this is a terribly impossible and controversial scheme. How many actual graduates come to your surgeries to complain about their graduate repayments? And the answer is virtually none. So I think the system, given the constraints we're under, has a lot of logic to it you can of course you're free to adjust it now i didn't agree with shittage's figures the figures as i understand them is the current mix is it's about 75 percent graduate repayment and about 25 percent taxpayer and that's it's absolutely right if you're in a low paid job we don't expect you to pay back it's a it's a progressive system you can make it more progressive and not and uh, or you can make it less progressive you could change the 75 25 formula if you like there's absolutely no right answer to that and it is a legitimate matter of public debate what, what should the repayment threshold be i agree with everyone else we need to increase the fee level at minimum by inflation and most of this agonized debate would not be happening if we'd simply indexed fees for the last 10 years that would have be that is the blindingly obvious solution and the can and one reason why the uh, sector is in a bit of a funk is they somehow have persuaded themselves that the blindingly obvious is also impossible which is not the case you can just do it if we were to secure any increased public expenditure of higher education, I'll tell you what my priorities would be. First of all, not graduates, students. We often elide, the, the, it's currently a graduate repayment system and quite, to be honest, relatively progressive. I worry about students struggling to make ends meet at university. I think the most shocking figure recently was we've now gone above 50% of students working well at university and we know a few hours is fine. But if it's more than that, it really does start affecting your capacity to study and to enjoy the higher education experience. So my view, which is exactly what I always had in conversations with the NUS, whatever they, they didn't actually in my meetings with them ever really fight about fees and loans. What they fought about was maintenance grants and maintenance loans, quite rightly. I would put, if I had any money, one priority would be bring back maintenance grants and increase maintenance loans for students. The second thing I would do, contrary to, again, the assumption in Digi's paper that there's kind of no help for high cost subjects, we put in a significant amount of help for high cost subjects, but probably not enough. And the differentiation for high cost subjects relative to the generality of fees, I would put in some money for those. The third thing that um, I would do, I would welcome the fact that we've got a demographic, demographic surge and probably the underlying trend is for increased participation. It's slightly hard to read at the moment because of the artificial surge during COVID and a little bit of a fallback afterwards. But it's one of the more reliable observations about advanced Western countries that basically, if you look across the OECD, every year in every country, percentage rates of participation go up. That is a good, reasonable starting point. And in that context, we are indeed going to 
have either very large universities or I would have an, uh, an initiative which, to be fair to them, John Denham launched many years ago. And we I tried, but with uh, not much success, a kind of universities in new places, cold spots, the small towns in England that still don't have a university, an FD college getting university title, creating greater links to um, hub universities. So I would have spreading more universities and higher education across the country, help for students, help for high cost subjects. And I, I, sorry, there's many other points I'd like to make, but I'll just end with this, differentiation. Um, first of all, thank heavens we're not differentiating the way they are in California, where you're told what your job is. What we have is an open system with lots of implicit differentiation. We have an open system where we don't tell Northumbria or Lincoln, it is presumptuous of you to imagine you could do some research which might be so good that it's funded. We have an open system where a dynamic university can rise to the challenge and carve out some research niches. However, from my time on UKR board, I have to tell you, most of the debate was about why so much of our research grant and research funding went to about 10 universities or less. The actual differentiation is in the quantum of public research funding, which is massively diverse. If it's differentiation on fees, I have had hundreds, if not thousands of people who want differentiation on fees. I can't think of two of them who've ever agreed the basis on which the differentiation should happen. Sometimes I'm told these subjects are so wonderful, like engineering, we should cut the fees. Other times I'm told it's so expensive, we should increase the fees. Sometimes I'm told research intensive universities are so wonderful, they should have higher fees. And I'm told that they're also full of middle-class students and actually the obligation is to London Met which is as an equivalent of the pupil premium, so that the, universe, the un, less fashionable universities taking the poorer students should have, should have the, the extra popularity from lower fees. Nobody, everybody starts by saying they want differential fees. There is no common view. My view is that's why we've ended up with this system, which is a basic university fee at a, a stable level. It should be stable in real terms, on top of which we fund high cost subjects and fund low income students. That is a good progressive model. And it's no accident that over tw the last 20 years, all three main political parties have endorsed it. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Uh, great point. And uh, I just wanted to check uh, Shitty or any of the panel coming back on anything that's been said so far. Any responses before I, I'm getting my questions in order? Yeah, Shitty. Well, th thank you to all. And I think, David, since you raised a number of questions, I don't think I can respond to all of them and quickly, but I'm trying to say, where might we find agreement between what you've said and what, what, what the rest of us have said in many ways? I think even you would agree that the fact that there has been no link to, to inflationary increases, that if 9,000 was adequate 12 years ago, and the equivalent of that is 6,000. Clearly something has gone wrong. Now we may differ as to where the money needs to come from, but the government can't have it both ways in the following way. In other words, you're quite right in saying that the fee should be allowed to rise, let the market decide, but then you can't blame the universities for not reaching certain participation targets because the university is like most businesses then. So in other words, either we are utilities or we are businesses. If we are businesses, we would adjust prices to where our product, though I hate to think of education in those terms, but if you'd force me to, I can, um, will find its right customers and the customer numbers will adjust and the business will adjust. Or we are a utility where we feel that this is a provision that a nation must have at a 50% level, in which case we have to agree as to what is the right level of funding depending upon performance. But I would want to know where you would stand in, in that, mindful that at the moment, the English system, when I was saying, by the way, 10 to 15 percent, that was not a loan repayment. I was talking about the total contribution of the English system to the overall cost of education at the moment. So I'm just wondering, what are we more like? A market where we can actually change our prices so we find that equilibrium? Or are we a utility where we owe something to society, where we must hold a certain number? Great. Well, uh, Vivian, please come in on. I, I just thought uh, that tangentially re re uh, uh, relevant to what Chitty just just said, but I think it's extremely important that we keep reminding people that the the design of the graduate uh, contribution scheme was was a kind of bargain. 
uh, between the student and the and the nation. You know, recognizing that both the individual and the um, and the nation benefit from an individual going to university. Um, the the deal was. You take the risk. You don't know what's going to happen to you in the future. You may get knocked off your bike and never be able to work. Um, we're behind you. If you do something socially valuable but not uh, high income, we're behind you. The, what happened after the financial crisis was a kind of adjustment of the balance. And, you know, I think that fundamentally we should do a better job of asserting the idea that it should always be a balance because both the individual and the nation benefits. And that balance, that balance might be a little bit wrong. And then I suppose, you know, in, in response to Shishi's question, that it's neither a pure market nor a, uh, you know, a, um, a, a public uh, service. It's kind of a bit of both, and that's complicated and messy. And that's why the system for funding it probably has to be complicated and messy. Very good. Thank you. No, I, actually, I do think it is a, it is a, comp I, I would agree with what, with what Vivian was saying. And look, the, the, I, I um, said, in the early days, there would be price competition, which was a silly thing to say, and it was rapidly disproved, because the fact is, if you have a Greek graduate repayment system of the sort we've got, thank heavens, a student who said, oh, I'm going, I'm, I'm going to save a uh, thousand pounds, I'm not going to go to uh, UCL for nine thousand pounds, I'm going to save a thousand and go to King's for eight thousand pounds, would not be understanding the basics of the system. That is, if you wish to have price sensitivity, you're also going to have to change your repayment system so it is less progressive. So it was a so I was wrong ever to suggest there'd be price competition. It's a good thing there isn't price competition. What it should be is students choosing what they want to do and then the money going with them on a basic level with extra cost if it's a high cost subject. And the that's, that is how it worked. And indeed now, because we've liberalized it, and in this model, you also don't have number controls. In most of these public expansion models, you do have number controls. Because we got rid of number controls, more people are able to go and more students now get their first choice of university, which is another good thing. And maybe one of the reasons why the uh, participation rates are quite high. We've got something over 80 percent of students now getting their first choice, which is another good feature of our system. It's a high, it's a it's a student choice based system, which is not some dangerous neoliberal experiment. It was always the English model. Mm. Very good. Very good. I'll just check James anything come in and I'll get or I'll get on to the questions um let's go to questions I think yeah great uh well so, um, first of all thank you brilliant set of questions and we're not going to get through the vast majority of them clearly in this time but incredibly useful for us so don't we will be looking at these and it will help shape our thinking on what are the important things that what people want to pick up with and I'm going to be incredibly democratic in this as well because I, I, the upvoting really helps me in my chairing because I can just go from the top which is good. And I think uh, Diana Beach came up with a question that, that shot up the voting um, later on. I think it's a very good point. Uh, if we're going to continue measuring the value for money of, of HE on graduate outcomes, then surely we need to change the triangle into a square and bring in employers who need highly skilled, work-ready graduates, yet are also currently claiming to be sad as they're not getting the talent they need. How do the panellists propose we do this? James. Well, I mean, as Diane knows, this is something we do already. Um, as someone who's new to the sector, it's interesting to, um, you know, you often hear from school colleagues that, you know, universities don't have the same level of data and um, uh, improvement where, which schools are subject to. But actually, you look at the TEF and the focus on, you know, a math student uh, survey and focus on outcomes, uh, uh, it, it does point us towards employability. And... Frankly, even if we didn't have it, you know, our, whenever we talk to students, whenever we survey them, they want to know both about employability and actually about setting up businesses. So actually UAL, more people set up businesses coming out of my university than any other university, according to some measures. So I would add startups to and you know, setting up businesses. I think we need to widen the way in which we measure uh, graduate outcomes after university because, you know, again, our, our subjects, people are still often working out their practice five years uh, five years out so we need to think carefully about what those measures are but then fundamentally we, we need to put it into the core curriculum uh, of, of all of our students and we need to work with employers to make sure that that is something that all of our students have you know I think we, we worry about when it's too much outside the cur curriculum and, and, and electives and that creates its own uh, roots to inequality so I think you know we do have the right incentives and Diane is absolutely right to say that that is both what our students want and what will support public 
um, enthusiasm for university. So I think it's a very, very good point. Mm. Thank you, James. Shitty Jones. There's no film called Square of Sadness. That's one of the <laughs> downsides as far as I'm aware. But Shitty, any, any thoughts? No, I'd probably address one of the next ones. So thank you. Uh, Vivian David. Yeah, Vivian. Oh, you're muted, Vivian. Sorry, the amateur at this stage. Um, I would start with what they already pay for, right? Because there is already, I mean, we, we, I, David's right, this, when he said it's Groundhog Day, we've been talking about this since dear old Lord Deering talked about the kind of three beneficiaries and the kind of one we could never really crack was how do you get employees to contribute? But I suppose I sort of look at it from the other perspective. They do, they do contribute in all sorts of ways. So the obvious way is through, you know, models like apprenticeships. But under the bonnet, there are billions of other ways. So there are there are closed courses. There are um, there are kind of deep partnerships. You know, where a kind of a, a particular employer will work absolutely alongside a um, a university to deliver education in a particular way. So, for example, the Unipark facility in Coventry. Um, you get employers contributing to curriculum, to um, to content. You know, real life case studies to placements. So, I guess my answer is yes. We need more of that, but can't we build out? From the things that employers already clearly demonstrably and um, value rather than necessarily starting with we should just sort of tax them and I, I can't see any government being terribly keen on applying some sort of blanket tax uh, but I, that's where I'd start but I think it's a fascinating thing to talk about. Hmm. Anything to add David or we'll move on yeah yeah and then the question the question that's come to the top now is it is really interesting we touched on in Shittich paper um, too but just a direct question why is it so expensive to put a home student through a degree and, yeah uh, so schools get six six thousand have lots of other responsibilities we have ways to make money uh, in other sorts of ways i don't think the sector has adequately answered the question which causes these issues with politicians is this is the first question they ask yes i i think look that's a fair challenge and um Oh, when I did say this is the finest university system in the world, I didn't say it was the cheapest university system in the world. And uh, very critical, very much at the heart of any university system is something uh, we'd call a student-staff ratio. Um, and I'm sure in schools you have the teacher-pupil ratio. And it would be fair to say that the British universities have historically had a favorable, as compared to some international comparisons, uh, staff-to-student ratio. And they have good things to show for it. As I said, they show an 80% graduation rates. There are some continental systems with a much uh, less favorable student to staff ratio, and they have much lower graduation rates. Um, so I think one of the things that our universities do absolutely deliver uh, is a better graduation rate for what I would say is a relatively higher cost from other systems. Now, then the, the other reality is that as we have become more internationally competitive, it is not just a local system that you're looking for. You've got to make sure that your amenities are now internationally competitive. So you're competing with the Australians and the Canadians and the Americans in this, um, which in some sense our local schools are not. So I would say those are the two issues that perhaps distinguish our relative school expenditure from our relative university expenditure. And I think James uh, will add to that, perhaps. Yes, I mean, you know, schools are incredibly important. We want them well funded. Uh, so, so I think it's um, it's not about talking down what, what schools need. But, you know, again, I'm at London College Communication. I walk around here. You look into animation, you look into graphic design, you look into gaming, and we're using a huge amount of computing power, and there, there are costs associated with the university education which are um, which are not born. And we we do bear, you know, all, all of the costs of student support, mental health support, etc. So I, I think it's the comparison, as Shitty says, is with other international systems. We are going to need to improve our efficiency. There's no there's no solution, I think, to the triangle which doesn't inv involve that. But I think there's a fundamental point in what Shitty says, which is if we cut significantly, say, towards school levels, what we spend as a unit of resource in universities, it would cost us, it would cost the public purse money rather than save it money because we would have fewer international students come here because the quality would be lower, uh, whatever we did in terms of efficiency than in competitive countries. And when you go and look at why students say they want to come here, 
very clearly the first thing they say is the high quality of our education. So mm. far from saving money that way, you would actually potentially in, uh, enter a doom loop where we were losing international students. We lost the cross subsidy that we get that would reduce the quality and you can imagine the rest. Very good. David. The school university comparison is not level playing field. Uh, of the nine K fees, 1,000 goes on access spend. There's no equivalent of that for schools. The school figures exclude capital, which is a separate budget. I can still remember the argument of the Treasury. The fees are going to enable universities to cover the costs of borrowing because they're going to have privately financed capital. We can get rid of the public expenditure capital budget. Uh, one of my many regrets, it's a point that James has been making, is I wish they were called university fees, not tuition fees. They're fees for a total experience that includes... Mm access to sports facilities, a theatre. Yeah, so it's that uh, the comparison isn't quite the way it implies. And by the way, in Shittage's sphere, we should also remember the English system, a lot of our R&D happens in universities. That changes the ratios of staff to students compared to other countries which have less of their research at university base. Mm. Very good. Vivian, did you want to come in? Only to say the people on this call and other people we have to convince and the, the I think the idea behind the question is damn right we have done a poor job of explaining why universities are different from schools and we ought to do a better job. And that's that's the final question and any uh, just to spin round very quickly in in a few seconds each the the, the next question is about our image. Um, uh, HE has enjoyed increased media coverage over the past few years. If you read below the article comments, and I don't know, sometimes you can read in the article comments, um, it's not, the rhetoric is overwhelmingly uh, negative. Um, how do we counter that attitude without appearing greedy, self-serving and entitled? And any final thoughts for how to get to a brighter future dealing with that? Um, maybe if we go a little bit in reverse order, uh, David, any any reflections on that or final thoughts? I think universities are great civic institutions. They transform people's lives. And I think the King's mission statement of a few years back, focusing on being both a global university and serving this city and this area, rooted, anchor, globally led outlet, outlook institutions is fantastic. David James. I think it's a very good warning. And I think anyone who doesn't think so should look at what's happened in America to the general support for universities amongst Republican families and amongst uh, young people. So, and that is now directly impacting on, on recruitment. So I think in, in everything that we do, making sure that we look after students in particular, so they become advocates for the rest of their lives. And I think, you know, we haven't always done that as well as we could in the last two or three years, but that's probably a whole, a whole different topic. Uh, well, it's the grand challenge that we face, and it's uh, as James has suggested, not uh, isolated. In it's not just it doesn't it's not just our system that faces this um, challenge. Um, well, I think we have to ensure people see us as serving this society, not serving ourselves, and that our efforts should be dedicated towards what we can do for the country, not what the country can do for us. That's got to be part of the answer. And then we need to do a much better job of opening, opening a lid and sh sort of showing people what universities are doing. And that's a challenge for us. Thank you. And finally, Shittich. Yes, and I think we're caught on the wrong foot on, on two things. The more we talk about fees, it seems that we're talking about money. And uh, I think a very sad um, uh, way that universities have been pigeonholed is around the international student issue that it's made to look as if we're doing more for the world than we're doing for the country, which is entirely untrue. In fact, we wouldn't be able to do what we do for the country if we did not have the support of the international students. So look, it's a big job for us to explain, but I would admit that we start on the back foot of both. Talking about fees looks like we're talking about money, talking about international students gives the appearance that we're devoted more to something beyond our borders. Um, so look, we have to do this collectively. It's not about one university, but it is a challenge. And, and I think you're quite right. Uh, if you read the readers' comments, they're not with us for the moment. Great. Well, I'm going to have to call it there. Um, thank you again for all the great questions. We will look over those. So before, very final thanks from me. As mentioned at the beginning, I did want to flag that our next event is going to be the first in a VCs in Conversation series that we, we hope to get going, where we can bring in other voices alongside VCs and, and their experience. And the first will be Shittage in Conversation with Charles Clark. Uh, who was, of course, Secretary of State for Education and Skills and has done a lot of thinking since on the future of universities. That's on the 21st of March, and I think the link has just appeared 
in the chat now. You have to quick click on it quickly because the it will disappear as the call ends. But we will obviously send out the invitation to everyone here. So kindly for me, just to say some thanks to uh, different groups. So to all of you for coming, uh, first of all, to the team at the Policy Institute, great work in putting all this together. Uh, to thank our panel for their excellent comments. And of course, Shittage for the great paper that got us started on this. Thank you all. <laughs>